Hello, I'm here with Paul Lentecook. Paul, how does the traditional Inupiat cycle of life compare to what we learn about American history? I think it's surprising and it's at odds with sort of the, the image that most people have about Native American, American Indian lives and social structures. It's far more organized and it's far more disciplined and it's much more of a set of informed decision making that has to occur if you're going to survive in the Arctic for thousands of years rather than, you know, a week or two days or whatever that American survivor stuff is. The best way to think about it is sort of the, when I try to sort it out is the image that people typically have about Eskimos or uh, Inuit. So normally it'll, it'll start out have this blank white screen. It's just white. And you'll hear on, on the sound, it'll go, shh, 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 shh. Because if you're in the Arctic, it's always a blizzard, right? So, and then the screen will focus in and you'll see these little black dots and the little black dots turn into people as they pan in closer and closer. And we're in a line and as Eskimos always do. We're going, shh, shh, shh. and what we're doing, of course, is walking into the blizzard. I don't know why we do that, but Hollywood always has us walking into the blizzard. Seems kind of foolish. And then sometimes, like Grandma, will fall over, you know, head first in the snow, and everyone will just keep walking. Right? It's, and then you get the voiceover, the Charleston Heston kind of a voice saying. In a ceaseless quest for survival, the hardy Eskimo are in search of the caribou. And it gives this image that I think is another reinforcement of this view that you're out there saying, hey, Frank, which way do you think we should go on the compass to run into some caribou? And if you're random like that, you don't get to live very long in the Arctic and you don't get to reproduce, and you don't have a culture here for thousands of years. So we have to get at that. We have to somehow challenge that, that perspective. And one way to do it is to look at uh, Anupiat, or Northern Eskimo life, and how it was and often is structured today. The most important thing is it's seasonal. So we have a winter camp, we have a spring camp, camps. We have a summer camp, fall camp, traditionally. This was much more integrated and structured before the uh, introduction of uh, compulsory school attendance, which really has impacted and in, uh, and in some communities has broken a lot of that cycle. And people will say, well, it's only this part of it. It's only for this many kids. But you have to think about it as it's a wheel. And if you take off a section of the wheel, the rest of the wheel is impacted, right? So just quickly uh, to get examples, which are too, it's too complicated to really do justice in a short video. I want to reference some text that'll allow people to get a first hand or inside view or more, more of an informed perspective about this. And the first one that I would suggest is this text. It's 50 Miles from Tomorrow by William Hensley. Politically a very important person, economically very important in Alaska history. His early section about growing up includes growing up in traditional life. But already it's a traditional life that has schooling competing and eroding a part of that traditional cycle. But it's there, and it's a great description of what it's like to experience that conflict. In a larger setting, there's this great book called Inhabited Wilderness by Theodore Caton, and it's Indians, Eskimos, and the National Parks in Alaska. And Inhabited Wilderness is a great title because it's specifically addressing people who always think that they're always doing good. 
and that would be conservationists and environmentalists, which is something like missionaries in an earlier era they, who always thought they were doing always good. But there are consequences, are collateral consequences, to having these deeply set beliefs and working on them. One of them is you end up with an odd thing of calling places wilderness, which means uninhabited by people. And if you use that term, you then have to ignore Native Americans, American Indians, Alaska Natives that have been using and occupying specific areas by tribal group for often hundreds, if not thousands of years. Another text, and this will broaden the discussion just a little bit, it's by Paul Bean Carlo, and it's called Nulato, an Indian life on the Yukon, meaning the Yukon River. It's hard to get a hold of, and it's well worth finding. The great thing about it is the Athabascans are on the other side of the border for much of the Nupiat, uh territory. Different cultural group, different language group. In some ways similar, in other ways different in its cultural cycle. Paulding Carlo describes it with a very informed sense of this is what it means to live in this. And you get a contrasting view and a comparison to uh, the cycle of life that I'm talking about now. Excuse me. So the, the trick is now jumping in and briefly describing this cycle of life. There are these camps that you're in or these communities that you're in. Now, historically, the problem was that missionaries and federal employees and often missionaries who were federal employees were being taken up by the revenue cutters, well, the precursors to the United States Coast Guard. They would take people up the coast, unload these kind of prefab parsonage school teacher housing, which were also the teach of the school building and the church. And when they offloaded, they offloaded wherever they saw a significant group of native peoples. And then that's where it would go. And it would be these compulsory school attendants in this setting. Of course, the problem with that is they're coming up during the summer. So many of the villages that are fixed in place are fixed in place for summer, but it's a disaster for the longer season, which is winter. They're places without access to fresh water, without space for growth, without stability. They're exposed to winter winds. And often, particularly new teachers or administrators will look at uh, an Alaska Native village if they're starting to teach there and say, why would you put a village here? And the answer is, it's not us, it's your for your forefathers who uh, helped to pick this out, uh, the location. Uh, Kivaline is a prime example of that. It's a, it was a place that's great for drying fish, but it's a terrible place for living in the winter time. So, once you're into this, you have to think about how do we prepare people to live in this cycle of life? And it, it's lifelong. As a young person, generally an uncle or an aunt is taking care of somebody's further education. And they start by just letting them observe, by taking them out and maybe they're helping to bring water or they're whatever they're capable of. You're putting them to work. And the idea is they're going to get a sense of the location. They'll get a sense of what it looks like, what it feels like, so that all that's in place. None of that's a surprise by the time they get old enough, in the case of often boys, but not entirely, uh, to start hunting. And hunting will start early. It'll start with ptarmigan. It'll start with rabbits. It'll start with hare. But the idea is you're learning how to contribute to a community. So fundamentally, what we have is a we perspective, because an I perspective doesn't allow you to live very long in the Arctic. It's a, it's a team game. 
uh, in order to do this. There's a, a wide variety of tools, many of which people don't know that we have. We actually have, traditionally, we've hunted seal in the wintertime underneath the ice with a net. And often people can't even imagine what that would look like. And it's not easy, but it does work. So another one is to set up a fish traps so that you get this reliable food source throughout the winter. Another thing is to collect piles and piles, baskets full of blueberries and uh, preserving those in seal oil so that they're available in the winter, which is a part of the reason why we don't get scurvy, because we got a source of vitamins. It's always preparing the tools. It's preparing these young people to know the key locations. Typically in the Arctic, you'll get this surge of abundance in a very narrow place, like where the caribou come through a pass or across a river, or where the berries are best in a certain time of the year, or when the different kinds of salmon are running up at different points of the year upriver, so that you want to be in these temporary eight, uh, places of abundance, and you have the tools and knowledge to take advantage of that abundance. That's traditional life. Sounds easy, but it's complicated. The most important thing about this is, this isn't just Anupia or Athabasca. It's Native American people up and down the coast. So when Daniel Boone goes into the wilderness and chops down trees, He's not doing it in a vacant parking lot. He's doing it in traditional land areas by some group. This is their home. These waters and lands belong, are, are seen as the tribe belongs to this area. And that's counter to a lot of the history or impressions that we get in media about American history, which is somehow we're just America's going across this and pushing back a few Indians, but it's mostly vacant land. And also that it's somehow just wilderness rather than there are places where uh, farms, gardening is being done, food is being planted, peas, squash, pumpkins, all that Thanksgiving stuff. It had to come from somewhere and it's not collected out in the wilderness. It's grown in these very particular lots. It's so at odds with how people generally, uh, what we bring stereotypically to American history. But it's important to not only know about this, but to have it inform that narrative of the early American history, and the American history that's been going on in Alaska since 1971, certainly. It's worth reading, and it's worth trying to figure out and learn more. And there are many texts on this field of history. Yes, thanks for those extra resources. That'll be great. All right.